Charunas Bartas is a name that for most people won't ring too many bells once mentioned. However, behind this unique and very Lithuanian name, lurks a director of remarkable talent that has trailed a solid yet somewhat inconspicuous path in the film world, while managing to earn praise, nominations and awards in various film festivals, although still missing a main prize on the most renowned. At some point later on this channel, Bartos' career will be given a proper study and analysis, but on today's video the spotlight is turned to his feature film debut, Three Days. Produced by the company established by Bartos himself, Studio Kinema, as the first independent film studio in what was then a Lithuania that had also very recently obtained independence from the disintegrated Soviet Union, the film was shot and exhibited in 1991 by the director's 27th year showcasing already a spirited intellectual maturity and a confident aesthetic identity in which to develop and enhance the former. In three days, the meager plot structure acts less as the operating narrative that propels characters and supports the causality of conventional storytelling, acting more as a vehicle for expressing an elusive and at times unspeakable existential disquiet. A compact description of the storyline would entail mentioning a trip to Kaliningrad by two Lithuanian youths who then bump into and befriend two other Russian girls, while the group struggles to communicate not due to language barriers, since all speak Russian, the difficulty deriving instead from their hopeless lives lacking sense, purpose or interest, which fuel an overpowering apathy that prevents them from connecting in ways beyond the purely physiological realm. Additionally, no names are ever disclosed to the spectator, and together with the minimalism of the acting, sparse dialogues, passive albeit gorgeous cinematography, and lack of a clearly defined narrative in typical film terms, the film leaves much to be grasped entirely to its viewers. Granted, this may not be the finest and most attractive film synopsis, if the intention is to entice potential viewers to sit down and watch it all the way through, but one will also be lying if such characterization does not immediately bring to mind the fascinating meditations of Michelangelo Antonioni or Ingmar Bergman on the predicaments of communication among troubled subjects, looking for a way to transpose the indefiniteness and misleading character of verbal exchanges in a world that imposes alienation almost as a rule through the sheer absurdity of its mystifying dwellings. In other words, the perfect film to watch in a summer Sunday afternoon with friends and family. All jokes aside, the film is definitely conceived to probe a dark facet of modern society that may or may not be every viewer's cup of tea, but whatever the preference of its spectator, there's something quite profound, if unsettling to a degree, to take away and worth pondering from its bewitching depiction of youthful lethargy. And its substance, together with the way it is presented, is bound to appeal to readers acquainted with Sartre's nausea or Pessoa's The Book of Disquiet, for example. With a visual atmosphere at times resembling four months, three weeks and two days, the 2007 Romanian masterpiece by Christian Munkiu, three days displays the environment of post-Soviet Kaliningrad, presented in a crude, piercing light. It's a drab port city with World War II scars preserved intact that is brimming with mostly drunken Russian sailors that are preyed by prostitutes looking for a quick exchange. The scenario is bleak and unappealing beyond description, almost post-apocalyptic in its decaying fashion, exposing the crumbling surroundings and neglected infrastructure together with the indistinguishable ghosts that haunt it in apparent meandering tours. The outdoor scenes are ominously cloudy and windy, oppressed by anemic tones of pale grey and dirty, light earthy hues, reflecting the muddy soil and dilapidated building walls. When indoors, the light remains dim, but not enough to hide the aged, greasy, soiled walls of the interiors with their peeling paint coat and cracking ridges. It's a depressing backdrop that suits perfectly the emptiness that exudes from the characters' benumbed utterings and actions, while they clumsily attempt to connect. This neurasthenic atmosphere that begets the youth's idleness is supported by long periods of silence and exiguous utterances that occasionally arise, but is also heightened by the ambient sounds that echo during their wanderings outside and while inside their lodgings. This approach brings to mind a Bressonian practice in which the soundscape acquires particular relevance when it comes to shroud the viewer and drawing him into its atmosphere. Ultimately, the crashing of the waves by the seaside, the barking of dogs at the distance, the sheep horns ringing from the port, the chatter humming and music reverberating from the bar, or the crushing, overwhelming silence, all play a role in texturing the film's canvas, but also confer particular weight to each and every expression, 
beat an untroubled and authentic laugh or an unexpected doleful weeping. The characters act and are guided instinctively, without much consideration, never really disclosing if there's some sort of intentionality related to it, apart from their corporal impulses. People eat, drink, smoke, have sex and sleep, a pattern that seems to have been going on since time immemorial and without an apparent end, its subjects acting as if locked in an unending cycle in which time has frozen. Bartos depicts this acute youthful ennui with frankness and no romanticizing, delivering a portrait of the post-Soviet reality in Lithuania and Kaliningrad that likely mirrored many other places in Eastern Europe at the time. Towards the closing of the film there is a particular scene of considerable weight, in which a metaphysical monologue is voiced by an old man that receives one of the Lithuanian youths in his lodging in order to socialize with him. He seems to live and work at the hotel, where they dwell most of the time, and had previously come across and even attempted to interact with him and his friends on the courtyard, only to be ignored, but has now convinced him to step down to his accommodation. The scene is touching for depicting an attempted connection between the old and the new generation, something that seems likely to result in failure. Whichever the outcome, the old man doesn't avert from providing wise and timeless advice to his young listener, admonishing him on the transience of life and on self-inflicted torment, as he offers him a drink in his murky abode. The impermanent nature of life does actually permeate the fabric of the film extensively, but is most obviously noticeable, perhaps, on the film's final shot that reveals the effect and passage of the different seasons of the year on the boys' home back in Lithuania. It's a stirring image that aptly represents the mood of the film, with both simplicity and directness, at the same time liable to be taken as a hopeful message for the people under the yoke of pessimism at the time, by reckoning change and regeneration as the definitive and immutable principles of existence. As for the warning on the afflictions imposed by oneself, it's another message that reflects the film's existential tone and impels meditation on the notion of resisting despair and actively seeking one's self-determination. Analyzing oneself and what one submits himself to may carry an uplifting tone to the people at the brink of desperation in such dire circumstances, with the aim of encouraging and returning to them the confidence to face adversity. In a sense, it appears then that Bartos may be indirectly telling its viewers that despite the crippling apprehension and distrust that hovers above many people's heads, one should strive not to fall into despondency or apathy, but instead to self-actualize and acknowledge one's autonomy, to look bravely into the eyes of hardship, take the initiative and endeavor to overcome it. Whatever the actual meaning behind this short but inspiring discourse, that actually comprises the very last words spoken on the film, 11 minutes before it reaches the end, it's a low-key but powerful episode that conducts the viewer to another highly compelling scene. Despite its desolate narrative, by the second half of the film, the spectator is restricted almost entirely to observing the main couple of youths and is exposed to their continuing quiet interplay that food slogs in a swamp of creations, riding in almost purely functional dialogue. While seemingly stuck in their static, low-energy bubble, the subconscious anguish fed on their proposals drifting and feeble interactions gradually builds within them and finally overflows in a much-affecting visual coda, where the dejection is given a platform to convey itself unrestrainedly. This arresting scene follows the previous conversation with the old man, and it's in it that Bartas' empathy reveals itself most clearly, as the character duo finally envelops within one another passionately, while avoiding face-to-face -face looks, their innermost feelings cascading profusely and bursting out as if previously held under great pressure. It's a cathartic and vigorous emotional release of particular poignancy, no doubt aided by the contrasting diversion and dancing scene happening nearby simultaneously, that discloses the sensibility that lies hidden beneath such grim representation of gloom, effectively betraying Bartos's humanistic view on the subject of estranged, forlorn people, solitary even while accompanied, emotionally isolated, lost among the ruins of a decaying environment. People who've watched Kieslowski's The Double Life of Veronique or Haneke's The Seventh Continent, both very different films in themselves, will find that this scene appears to blend aspects of two key moments in them by welding sexually driven catharsis of two people with a soundscape of antithetical nature that exponentially augments the raw power of the scene. Adding to the opaque nature of the narrative, the cinematography complements perfectly the tone of the film by enclosing its story in wonderful alluring shots that eschew typical framing and shot duration, exhibiting also a penchant for underlit scenarios 
all aspects that viewers acquainted with Pedro Costa, probably the most important Portuguese filmmaker in activity, will definitely find familiar. Indeed, there seems to be a clear stylistic affinity between the work of the Portuguese master director and the cinematography in three days, which some of the shots currently being shown will definitely attest. One will be surprised by how similar a shabby post-Soviet hotel in Kaliningrad will appear to the decrepit dwellings in the now inexistent slum of Fontainhas in Lisbon that was so heavily featured in many of Costa's films. It would not be unexpected perhaps to also mention Three Days, as somewhat reminiscent of earlier Alexander Sokurov's work too. In a proper photographic analysis, Three Days is remarkable for its accurate application of the rule of thirds, either when slicing features horizontally in different planes, when assigning different visual pieces in assorted compartments, or when establishing elements along the grid lines, resulting in a subtle but aesthetically balanced cinematic visual language. It's a formal design that doesn't have to be glaring or strictly applied every time in order to produce shots of magnificent pathos and beauty but confer an almost imperceptible visual harmony. Three Days is a special film that undoubtedly won't excite viewers looking for a conventional, streamlined and straightforward narrative. However, an audience fond of dramas that dissect the depths of human soul with acumen, exposing the ravines that hide beneath the surface and the core of people's emotional substrate, will delight in Bartos' exploration of youthful alienation and miscommunication. Its themes of self-determination, purpose, responsibility, rebirth, authenticity, social conscience, emotional isolation, among others, will resonate with spectators touched by the works of other film masters that have dedicated their works to the understanding of ourselves as beings and associated relations, as well as our role in this world and time, with the film hopefully working as a spring for exploring the Lithuanian director's other works. Stay tuned for upcoming videos on Bartas' films and his career, as well as other directors and masterpieces from all around the world. Thank you for listening and see you next time.